Good evening. Welcome. It's Wednesday night. Wednesday night's the filling station of the week. You pull in. You say, fill her up. Let's take some time to be together as the family of God on a Wednesday night, opening the Word of God, sharing the Word of God. God bless you for being here with us. Don't forget to always go to our website to find the things that are going on at Calvary. Uh, encouraging you, praise the Lord, we're getting out of the snow season, so we're, you don't have to go looking for snow, at least not till we come back to November or December again this year. But may God bless you greatly there. I want to remind you also to register for our meetings that we have on Sunday mornings. We are here at obviously 9.30 and 11, and so there's registration for both of those services, encouraging you to sign up for those. Uh, you know you go to our website that we mentioned before, calvaryassembly.church. You tap, uh, click on the register button that's in the menu across the top or on, on your app, the drop-down menu, and then after you do that, you simply go to the register page, and on the register page, there's a special place for registering for services. Wednesday nights, we're here together, and always thankful, and this is what we're doing, you and I, together. Uh, I want them, you to make this a, a habit in your life and a part of your life that you're going to stick with. Don't forget that right after this service, right after the sharing of the word, Girls Ministries and Royal Rangers have their Zoom classes uh, together with their commanders and each of their individual sponsors. Can I remind you, just so you get it into the habit of doing it, is the daily videos that we have here at Calvary. Uh, you go to Facebook. Again, you can go to our website and click on the Facebook tab and go straight into that. And I would encourage you to watch those every morning at 7.30. You'll be blessed by seeing those. Uh, hey, this Saturday, so March 6th, tonight's the, the third, but March 6th, our moms get together and they have a 10 o'clock uh, meeting. You don't have to register for that particular one. They meet right here in the sanctuary. They have a variety of things they do, and we're calling you moms to come out. As of yet, there's no child care, so leave the kids with dad for now. But we're encouraging you to come out, spend about an hour and a half together with other ladies, being built up in the characters of Christ, being built up in, in the things of Jesus. And then I want to remind you that we're right in the middle of a series called The Blessed Life. And we started with, it starts with the heart. And then we said, it's time to take a test. And then this coming week, it's going to be first things first. And I, uh, this is probably the most important of the six sermons. This will be the most important. I encourage you, be there Sunday morning, 9.30 and 11, as we continue our series on The Blessed Life. And finally, I want to ask you to make sure that you're a giver here at Calvary. And so if you would just remember to give the, the variety of ways that you can see listed here on our screen in person, by email, online, and again, I want to urge you that if, if you're ready to make that step onto the, the digital platform of, of giving, now's the time to do it. Get it set up. And I just, again, I give you the testimony. Sister B and I do it. And, and it's worked very well, and it's helped us to be very faithful. And just, it, it really is a help. Plus, it's a help to your church. So if you can, God bless you. Well, tonight's study is entitled, My Heart and My Spirit, The Keys to Victory. And I've asked Sister B to come and share with us, so let's transpose right over, right now, as we go over and hear from Sister B. Well, it's just a great joy to share God's Word with you again this evening and our Wednesday night Bible study together. Tonight, we want to see how my heart and my spirit are keys to victory. Did you know that our life <laughs> is meant to be full of battles? We say, no, no, really? My life must be full of battles? Well, there are times of rest, there are. The Bible says when God gives us rest from our enemies around about. But still, life is going to be full of battles for two reasons. First of all, because you and I have a very real enemy. A very real enemy <clears throat> of your soul, of my soul. Do you know he was there? 
in the Garden of Eden, already <clears throat> seeking to deceive Eve so that he could steal God's best from her, God's plan, God's purposes from her life. And you know he's going to be present still in Revelation where God gives us the prophecy of end times and it says that after the thousand years of Christ's reign, he will be released, Satan will be loosed once again and yes, he will deceive the nations to rebel against God. So you and I have a very real enemy. And Jesus told us his three job descriptions so that we would understand that it is serious business that our enemy is in. The first one is this. The Bible says he seeks to kill. Yes, the life of Jesus in us is so powerful. But if he can bring death, if he can kill, all oh, he will do it through his deceits. You know, to be carnally minded is death. And unless you and I contend for truth, I will stand in truth. I will believe the truth in my heart. I will not accept his deceits. Well, death does set in. Death that he brings can touch my spirit, my soul, or my body. Yes, the wages for sin is still death, Romans 6. 23 says. But he is also a very real enemy because he seeks to steal. He wants to steal your peace today that Christ gives. He'd like to steal your children's souls. Yes, he would like to steal God's plans and purposes by causing us to be rebels deceived by his lies. Oh yes, he's a very real enemy. And unless you and I have truth, contend for truth, battle for truth in our hearts, <clears throat> we suffer defeat. But thirdly, the Bible says that he seeks to destroy Wherever you and I do not yield that part of our life to God, we refuse to bring it under obedience to the Lord. There Satan can bring destruction. It is not under the covering of the Lord. We have chosen in that area we do not want Jesus to be Lord. And so it is outside of God's protection and Satan brings destruction there. Yes, he is a formidable foe. That's why you and I must be people that wear God's armor, people of battle. But there's a second reason that we will have many battles in life, and that's because you and I have ground to take. Yes, God has so many promises in his word already given to us. But often we must enter the battle to take and possess them. It is much like God's people when they came out of Egypt. Pharaoh longed to keep them enslaved and later to kill them. But... He was a foe that was defeated. Exodus 14, 14, God said to them, through Moses, the Lord will fight for you and you will be still. Yes, so Pharaoh was even destroyed, but were the battles over? No, 
God had said to Abraham, their forefather, many years before, I have given your people the land of Canaan. It is theirs. But we remember that Joshua had to lead them in to possess it by battle after battle until it became their own. That is why Jesus said about God's kingdom that is no longer a piece of land, but his kingdom is within us, that he says this, it is the Father's pleasure to give you the kingdom. Yes, life is going to be a battleground, battling our very real enemy and battling to take what God has given for us to possess. But today, you and I want to understand that there will be um, some things that can easily stand in the way of victory. God speaks of it in Psalms 78. And in verse 9, he says there, the children of Ephraim, and do you remember that was the family or the tribe that Joshua was from. It says the children of Ephraim being armed and carrying bows turned back in the day of battle. They were armed. Oh, just like you and I. Ephesians 6.13 tells us that we can take the full armor of God so that we will stand in the evil day. Yes, we will. They too were armed, the Bible says, but they turned back in the day of battle. Why was that? Well, the previous verse, verse 8, tells us why. It says they were a generation that did not set their heart aright and whose spirit was not steadfast or faithful to God. There were two problems that caused them not to be able to stand in battle even though they were equipped with adequate armor. Their heart was not right and their spirit was not faithful. Tonight, you and I are going to look at both the heart and our spirit, how to set our heart aright and how to keep our spirit faithful with God so that we can stand victors in our daily battles. First of all, then, our heart. There are three things that you and I need to know about. Well, actually, let's, let's speak first of this. We must know this about our heart, that the Lord looks on the heart. Jesus said it. He said, God knows your heart. I believe that was in Luke, the sixth chapter. And then in Matthew 9, Jesus turned to them and said, God knows your, oh, it said, Jesus knowing their thoughts. He said this, why are you thinking evil in your hearts? He saw their hearts. Yes, we also um, know that in, in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 23, there God says, I am he that searches the mind and the hearts. But you and I are so programmed to think that since my heart is hidden, and I'm sort of at the moment behaving on the outside, that, well, my heart might not be such a great place, but it's all right. 
It's all nicely covered for the moment. But you know, our hearts matter to God. He looks on it. He sees if my heart is, is a rebel against him. He sees if there's evil thoughts there. Oh, he well understands if, if I have evil plans, if I have unforgiveness, if I have bitterness, if I have self-seeking, I want what I want. My heart isn't hidden to him. I need to know that so that I know that my heart is the thing I have to fix and not cover. I must fix it to have victory in the day-to-day -day battle. How then do we fix our heart or set our heart aright? The first understanding is found in Ephesians, the third chapter and verse 17. There he says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Hmm. You and I remember that Romans 10, 17 tells us faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. That my heart will have faith in it when I'm hearing the word of God about my present circumstance. When I'm hearing what God says about how I see that, when I hear what God says about what I love and what I cherish and my priorities, yes, when I hear what God says, that produces faith. And Christ can only dwell in my heart by faith. How can he have place there if it's filled with evil things. We must understand that if we're going to set our heart aright and stand in the day-to-day -day battle. But he tells us a second secret about having my heart be right and that is found in 2 Peter, the first chapter, and verse 9. 19, actually. 1 Peter, chapter 1, and verse 19. Ah, it is 2 Peter, I believe, right? Ah, it is right here. 2 Peter, chapter 1, and verse 19. Here, the Apostle Peter preceded these words by reminding those he was speaking to that, that he had been on the Mount of Transfiguration with the Lord Jesus. And he actually, with James and John, heard God <clears throat> speak from heaven and say out loud, This is my dearly loved Son. Listen to him. But then the Apostle Peter says this, but we have also a more sure word of prophecy. You and I know prophecy is when God himself speaks. He says, we have one even more sure than what I heard on the mountain. He says, it's the prophecy of the word of God. We have this. And he says, and you do well to take heed to it. Oh, do you and I take heed to this word? Do we say, yes, God is speaking and I'm going to take heed to it. He says, oh, do it. Until, he says, it will be like a light that shines in a dark place. Oh, stop with me and think. Maybe, maybe 
our marriage is, is not going so good. Maybe it's uh, a dark place, and, and we don't know what to do about it, and it just all seems hopeless. But then we say, oh, I'm going to go to God's sure word. And what does God say about marriage? If I'm a husband, what does God say I am to do? If I'm a wife, what does God say I am to do? And we take that word and we take heed to it and we say, I'm going to do that. I'm going to listen to that. I'm going to walk in that truth. And do you know what that is? In our darkness, it's like a little light that we begin to know the way. And if we keep taking heed to that, he says, until the day dawn. There's not just a little light, but we begin to say, oh, I see God's way. It's like the sun rising. I see God's way now. Oh, this is what I'm to do in my marriage or in this place that I can't figure it out. It's a dark place. And he says, continue walking in that light, taking heed to that word until the day star rises in your heart. Jesus, the morning star, until Christ dwells in my heart by faith in that area of my life where I have taken heed to his word. Jesus will rise in my heart and my heart will be set aright. It will be in the right place. And with my heart set right, I can stand in the day-to-day -day battle. But thirdly, he tells us in 1 Peter chapter 3, there's something else we must do to set my heart right so I can stand in my daily battles. He says there, sanctify the Lord in your hearts. Do you remember that we have a covenant relationship with the Lord Jesus? He died so that all that separated us would be gone, so that I can fully belong to him and he can fully belong to me. It's a covenant. We have something like that on earth. It's our marriage covenant. And you and I would be quite astounded if we come home and there we find that our husband or our wife has invited someone else to come and live. Suddenly she's invited another man or he's invited another woman. We would say it cannot be in a covenant relationship. And yet if our hearts, though we're in a covenant relationship with God, many times we will allow things there that stand up in the same place as Jesus has Sometimes it, it will even trump his authority. It will have the, the stronger voice, the louder say, but my heart won't be right to stand in the day of battle. I must sanctify the Lord in my heart. And in that next verse, he says, having a good conscience. Did you know our conscience is a gift from God to keep us right with him moment by moment? The apostle Paul said in Acts 24, 16, he says, every day I exercise myself that I will have a clear conscience that has no offense toward God or man. Yes, for you and I, Hebrews 10 teaches us to enter into the Holy of Holies, to have access to God's throne in prayer. We must have our hearts cleansed from an evil conscience. 
a clear conscience is something we must have for our hearts to be right. It is important. A cluttered heart where we haven't made things right with God or man. It may be what we consider a very small thing, and we keep telling our conscience to be quiet. It didn't matter. We tell our conscience to be quiet. It's, 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 it's not important. But God says, without a clear conscience, our path of life will be cluttered and cluttered and cluttered until we cannot walk in it without stumbling or falling. Yes, to set our heart aright so that we can stand in the day of battle, you and I must first walk by faith, hearing God. Secondly, we must take heed to his word until that light of Christ fills our hearts. That day star, the morning star, rises in my heart. And thirdly, I must sanctify the Lord in my heart. And there's no dividedness there, no duplicity, and my conscience is clear. But as you and I go back and remember that there were two things that makes it impossible for me to stand in the day of battle, the first one was if my heart isn't right. But the second one was... My spirit was not steadfast with God. How do I keep my spirit steadfast with God? Well, first we must understand this. What allows me to have a relationship with God so that I don't just have a religion? where I have a bunch of rules if I, if I go to church on Sunday, if I pay my tithes, if I'm generally nice, that's my religion. Well, those are certainly good things, but they don't let me know God and have a relationship with him. And so you and I remember what did God do? When Jesus died on the cross, when you and I come and receive the gift of forgiveness and we repent of our sins, the Bible tells us that God causes us to be born of his spirit and we can begin to know him. That's why 1 John tells us that we know that we are in him and he is in us because he has given us of his spirit. Yes. In fact, 1 Corinthians 6.17 says, whoever is joined to the Lord is one spirit. That's what makes your, rea your relationship with God and my relationship with God a reality. It's not just a dead set of rules, but it's a relationship God has given me his own spirit. He has given you his own spirit to be with us night and day, never to leave us. So how then can my spirit be, be faithful with God, steadfast with God? Let's look at three things. The first one is this. We must walk in God's spirit. Galatians 5.25 says, If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. If you and I are walking in the spirit, we're walking with God. Jesus, that means I'm, well, to walk with him, I must stay at his side. Jesus said it like this, abide in me and I in you. Yes, we must walk. 
We must not only be born of God's spirit, but we must learn to walk there. Oh, it's so beautiful in Ephesians chapter 2 and in verse 4. The Bible tells us that even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, God quickened us. Quickening is when God brings what is dead to life by his spirit. Yes, he, quick, he gave us his life, the eternal life of God by putting his spirit in us. And then it says he raised us up together. The Bible said he made Jesus the head and us his body. Oh, such love, such a relationship. And its reality is by walking by God's spirit. And then it's, he goes on to say in Ephesians 2, 6, he seated us in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, you know, our bodies are not there. And our soul is where we reason and take in the word of God and think and understand. But my spirit has a place seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It's another part of what God calls the mysteries of our salvation, but a wondrous reality. And if I will walk in the Spirit, the Bible says, first of all, in Galatians 5, 16, those that walk in the Spirit, they won't do all the desires of their sinful nature. He also tells us in Romans 8, 4, that when we walk after God's spirit, we walk with him, all the righteousness of God's law will be fulfilled in our lives. Not because we were trying, but because we were walking in the spirit. Yes, to keep my spirit aright, I must learn to walk in God's spirit at all times. But secondly, God's word tells us we must learn to be led of the spirit. In Luke chapter 4, 1, it says Jesus was led of the spirit. In Romans chapter 8, he tells us those that are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Led. Did you know that Jesus said that since he's the head and we're his body, that he wants his spirit in us to teach us all things. He tells us that in John 14, 26. His Holy Spirit wants to guide us, to guide someone. They must be led. A guide can't be behind me. He must be before me. He says he wants to guide us into all truth. The Bible says the Holy Spirit wants to show me everything. He says he wants to reveal in 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, the Holy Spirit wants to reveal to me even the deep things of God, the things that he has for those that love him. Yes, to keep my spirit right, I must learn to be led, to be poor in spirit, that I can be led of God's spirit. And lastly, he tells us this, if I want my spirit to, to be faithful to God so that I can stand in the day of battle, he says we are to be filled with the Spirit. How interesting that we can be in a covenant relationship such as marriage. We can live in the same house but not be filled with each other's company. Maybe the Husband or wife might be sitting at the table and the other one walks in and there's not even an acknowledgement or a hello or maybe just a little grunt, yeah, hi. Or and so they just move on because they can't be filled with each other's company because there's, 
there's a block there that, that they haven't opened their heart. Maybe we sit down at a table to, to be filled with someone's company, but they've closed their heart. So though we are in their presence, there is no fellowship. Did you know we can be born of God's Spirit and not let him fill us and enjoy his company? We're in the covenant, but there's no, we don't allow him to fill us and, and fill us with, with his fellowship. But Ephesians chapter 5 tells us how. He said, be filled with the Spirit. If you want God's company, the company of his Holy Spirit, he says, then be filled with his Spirit, speaking to yourself in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Oh, how quickly God sees we've opened our heart for his company, and he will come. But he goes on there without ending that sentence. He says, giving thanks always for all things that is necessary for God's Holy Spirit to draw near to fellowship with me. Because without that, I'm grumbling and murmuring and it's, I'm grieving him by saying God is doing a bad job in my life. He's wrong this time. So we, with that thankful heart, it's a heart of faith and God's Spirit is in good company there. But thirdly, he says, to have God's come to be filled with God's Spirit, we must submit ourselves to one another in the fear of God. And then he puts the period on the end of that long sentence. Yes, he says, in the body of Christ, because Jesus is the head, each part must submit to the other part. The heart must honor the liver and the liver must, must give way to the kidneys, and each part work with the other, honoring who they are, as each one then, too, has a relationship with the head. Oh, today, you and I want to stand in battle because we have a very real foe and because there's so much ground to take. But to do it, we have to have our heart right. And we have to have a spirit that is faithfully walking with God. Yes, then you and I will be victorious believers. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you that you have made ways for this heart of ours to have Christ dwell in it. For the day star to rise in it as we take heed to the prophecy, the word of God. Oh, Lord, you have also given us your spirit to walk in oneness with us, oh, God. Oh, Father, that we can walk in your spirit. We can be led of your spirit. We are to be filled with your spirit to enjoy fellowship with you. And, Lord, we will then be such a victorious people, ready for every battle. Thank you, Father. Bless us, your people. Strengthen us, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen.